Let's take some time now to delve deeper into soil and what it's comprised of and what makes a healthy soil healthy. What we can do to keep our soil in good condition to support all the plants and animals around it. Soil has certain characteristics. One of them is soil texture and that is just the mineral content of the soil. It's excluding the air and the water and the microbes. It's about the mineral content, so the soil particles of sand, silt, and clay. Those are uh, three size classes of soil particles. So the different percentages of sand, silt, and clay will give you a different texture. You might have a clay-like texture, or you perhaps you might have a sandy texture or loamy texture. A loam is has a little bit of sand, silt, and clay in it. Uh, the type of texture, again, will um, be an indicative of its ability to support the plant and how it will perform for you in a garden or agricultural setting. Soil structure um, is how the aggregates, these little clumps of soil, um, aggregate together. And a good soil structure would, has good pore spaces, open spaces where water can infiltrate and oxygen can get into the soil and CO2 can get out. Um, the oxygen needs to enter into the soil structure um, for plants, but mostly for the microbes in the soil for respiration. And um, those pores, too, that are created by the proper soil structure will be the, the venting of CO2 that is the, the product of respiration of microbes in the soil. Just like it's a product of you know humans breathing in O2 and out CO2, the soil has many mic microbes in it that do the same thing. And a good soil structure allows that exchange of gases, the CO2 out and the oxygen in. A healthy soil will have nice layers or horizons. Uh, a profile of the soil would have a nice, a rich, dark topsoil, and underneath that, usually a lighter subsoil. And pH is important too. You need the proper acidity or alkalinity or neutrality of the soil pH to properly support plants. Usually around 5.5 pH to about 6.5 is good for most garden and landscape plants. They like a more neutral pH. And it's that pH level that's more neutral which of a soil that has the most of the plant nutrients available in it. If a soil gets too acidic or too alkaline, that those pH properties of the soil will bind up the nutrients and they'll become unavailable to the plant. So even though the nutrients are there, the pH can um, prevent the plant from getting access to those. And then another soil characteristic is just the soil food web. The vast intricate web of living organisms living underground in the soil, microbes, protozoa, small animals, um, worms, all kinds of things that um, interact and exchange and it's all based on primary production which is the plants producing organic matter and organic matter filtering down into the soil which becomes the basis for the microbes to decompose and um, provide more nutrients to plants to grow again. So composting and vermicomposting with worms, um, those are processes where, where humans take the organic matter and um, create an artificial system which hastens that whole process of decomposition, which naturally happens in the soil food web. And of course, I've mentioned human manure and composting toilets, that's taking human waste and composting it, um, usually in an anaerobic process and making, rendering those things viable soil amendments as well. Not a system yet around here that is um, a, a legal or permittable, but, um, it, there are ways we can do it healthily and use uh, human waste as an asset rather than a liability. This is a compost pile being made by a couple of my friends working in Liberia on a permaculture project, um, taking the green material and the brown material and piling it up in um, a minimum of three cubic foot pile. And the green material, uh, this mixture, this recipe, um, encourages heat loving bacteria to proliferate and start to kind of kick off and catalyze that de that decomposition process and get these materials put in this pile decomposed and into a nice um, friable compost like soil pretty quickly. Of course soil that word means different things to different people. Uh, mostly most people would think of it as dirt 
And that's something that you can you just wash off of surfaces or your body or the vegetables that you eat. But someone who's like an engineer might think of it as a um, the medium for which they are building foundations for dwellings or structures. So it really depends who you're talking to. The Natural Resource Conservation Service um, in the United States, they have six different definitions of soil, depending on who you are, if you're an engineer or you're a farmer or you're a gardener or you're a forester um, or you're a textile uh, manufacturer. There's lots of different ways it can be categorized. And to the climate um, change modeler, uh, soil is both the storehouse for carbon and the source of carbon in greenhouse gases, such as methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. So soil has um, a lot of organic matter in it, and that has organic matter is made up largely of carbon. So the more organic matter we have in the soil, the more it is a storehouse for carbon, the more we quickly harvest and turn over or burn um, our vegetation or soils, the more CO2 and carbon is released into the atmosphere. So it can also be a, a, a problem. Um, so it can be a, a way that we're adding more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as well. If you were a hydrologist, soil would be that buffer, that um, area of the lithosphere, the rocks and minerals in the soils and in the Earth's um, mantle, that area uh, that stores rain and water and um, buffers flooding and provides drinking water and um, is the basis for a flow of rivers underneath that. And there's even soils um, underneath lakes and marshes. So hyd hydrologists see it in their own special way. And for those working in social or environmental justice, soil would really be something they're thinking about that uh, represents access to land, um, about acknowledging history of the past, um, about in our country would be slave, slavery and oppression. So people that were um, given lands um, like native peoples and then um, the less uh, underrepresented people usually given the poorer land and soil to deal with. Um, because really we're getting all our food and a lot of our resources and livelihood from the soil. So it makes sense that in a, a system where there's inequities, those would play out and be seen in the soil too. So we would have rich, uh, healthy soils fought over and captured by the ones that um, the people in society that have privilege and the poor soils be the ones that were given to or left over for the ones that do not have privilege. When I used to live in Guatemala, um, I was there for one year. It was uh, a few years after the end of their civil war, and their civil war was really about somewhat, you could say, about soil. What happened um, in 1959, there came um, a fairly centrist, if not democratic, ruler um, named um, Arbenz. He became um, the president of Guatemala. And he decided to give back um, some of these lands. A lot of them were privately owned by the United Fruit Company, which has a lot of international interests, especially in the United States. Um, give back a, the lands that weren't being used um, by anyone. They were government lands and they were in poor quality and um, they weren't being used and they had no market value. Give those lands back to the indigenous people from which they were taken. Um, by the European um, government of Guatemala long ago. Um, that is what really triggered the Civil War. The United States and some other countries that had a lot of interest in Guatemala at the time basically um, had Arbenz um, taken out. He was assassinated because he was, um, he was uh, threatening the land holdings and the livelihood of these international um, companies. One was called United Fruit Company. So um, that was a story about soils, poor soils given back to the indigenous people. Um, but even that was reprehensible in Guatemala. And it started um, this civil war where these were, um, the government gave these lands away, but then the, the um, Arbenz was assassinated and the new president tried to uh, made sure that indigenous people did not get any uh, own any of their these lands and um, 
the guerrillas or a coalition of many people, mostly indigenous, fought back for 39 years. So yes, soil can mean many things and it can be a representation of injustice or justice as well. The majority of gardeners or farmers, the soil is just the uppermost surface, the top soil on the earth, and it's what supports their crops and their livelihood. A biologist, it could be um, something that they're trying to understand and do research on the different microbial systems in the soil and nutrient and water movement. Um, it's a habitat to study and understand. And soil is all these things. Um, it's, it's living, has many living things in it. Um, it's very important for the health of the planet, including humans and all the other organisms. It's important for the atmosphere, the biosphere, the geosphere, the lithosphere. Um, it's important in many ways. I often find it really, um, to me, it feels very straightforward to make analogies between the human digestive tract, like our stomach, and soil. So in our digestive tract, in, in our, especially our stomach and intestines, is the layer, the boundary where inorganic materials are transferred into our body to become part of our living organic body. So it's that, um, that boundary. And the soil is very similar in the sense um, for plants who have inorganic nutrients in the soil absorbed um, through the soil into the plants becoming living biomass. And so um, it just, I think of that often when I think of you know, um, the sensitivity of soil and the importance of soil. If we damage that boundary layer, if it can't um, if nutrients can't pass from inorganic state to living things in ourselves or in the soil, you've got a big problem. And we're um, like people that get, um, oh, you know, their stomach lining gets worn down by too many, um, too much ibuprofen or too many acids or stress, you know, and your stomach is not going to work well and you're going to have issues. And our soil, if it's depleted and not healthy and it can't transfer those nutrients to living biomass, um, we're going to have a problem there too. A nice working definition of soil overall would be the upper layer of the Earth's lithosphere in which the plants grow, containing dark brown material of sand, silt, clay, and organic matter, water, air, microbes. It has a certain structure and texture. It has a certain um, type of pH that needs to be balanced, and that's our definition. In a tropical jungle area or tropical forest, usually the soils are pretty thin and poor, as I've mentioned when talking about designing for specific climates. What you have happening is so much warmth and humidity uh, precipitation pretty much year-round that any of the uh, minerals and nutrients in the soil and organic matter are broken down quickly and absorbed into the plant biomass, into the canopy. So there's not a lot of time for the soil to build up. It gets used quickly, meaning the nutritious part of the soil is used up by plants right away. So you don't have soil being increased or conserved necessarily in this type of situation. You have to work with that you know, by building your own soils and um, using strategies that will help you build that topsoil layer. However, in prairies, big open grasslands like the uh, middle area of the United States and of southern Canada, the Midwest, and those prairies that reach into um, southern Canada, those are huge grasslands that grow vigorously during the warm uh, spring and summer seasons. And then in the winter, it gets quite cold, so everything dies back. And uh, there isn't a quick use of the, that uh, organic matter in the soil. It doesn't get reabsorbed right back up into the plants again, like it does in the tropics, because growth stops for about six to seven months. So over time, places like grasslands and um, prairies build soil. It starts to be increased in the natural environment in those situations in a temperate climate. Of course, in our permaculture designs and other types of sustainable farming, we want to take advantage of those ideas. We want to help soil build up. We're adding organic matter constantly. 
you're seeing a large raised bed put in a tropical area. So you want to raise it up out of the um, kind of the flood zone and the, the soil that gets soggy because there's so much rain. Um, so this is a raised bed and then mulched with um, newspaper and even cardboard to keep the weeds down, keep the moisture in, reduce erosion. And then um, there's, it's mulched on top of that some kind of um, organic mulch, like it looks like straw or some kind of grass clippings, and then plant it into it. This is a way to increase the soil's um, natural capacity to support the plants over time. So you're not using an extractive, destructive method, you're using an enhancing regenerative method because you're putting more organic matter into the soil than can get used up by that one crop. I don't know what the plants are in this raised bed, but um, they could be a mix of perennials and annuals. I've always noticed the, this home that um, is on Garden Street in downtown Santa Barbara, and this is their landscaping, just solid dirt. It almost looks like they, they vacuum it to keep any of the organic matter like leaves or um, little particles that could start building up the soil. It looks like they're swept out. So this is a completely dead front yard, except for that citrus tree. Not a regenerative process, but definitely low maintenance. Another method of building up soil in um, a number of zones. You're seeing here this lasagna gardening method that's used to put right on top of um, lawns. So you're trying to get rid of the lawn by planting, by layering newspaper, cardboard, um, some kind of organic mulch, and then maybe some compost on top of the soil. And the cardboard and the paper is to um, basically suffocate the grass underneath it. But grasses, you know, once it dies, it's that's great organic matter. Lots of nice fine roots that add organic matter to the soil. And if this method can work really well to um, transition or transform a lawn into a um, more of a, a, a bed where you're planting perennials and things like that. Lasagna gardening. And uh, mentioned earlier, the soil profile or the horizons is a characteristic of soil. The O horizon or layer is the top one with partially decomposed organic matter and some biological activity. Right below that is the darker, richer A horizon, the topsoil, and that's where most of the minerals are, and that is where most of the biology is too, and most of the organic matter. Underneath that, the E horizon, you can have this, um, a, a leaching zone, meaning um, minerals and nutrients and even soil particles that are being washed down might hit the top of the subsoil right underneath that, that tan color, the third layer down. And because of the um, texture and consistency of that subsoil being different than the topsoil, um, sometimes minerals and different um, molecules and even um, soil particles can accumulate on top of the top of the B horizon in between the topsoil and um, the subsoil, giving you that E horizon, that leach layer. C horizon, partially. Um, decomposed parent material and weathered, and then the R horizon is just the unweathered parent bedrock. Here's a soil profile, just a example of one. You're seeing a little bit of the O horizon on the very top, some little broken leaves and stems of this um, turf that kind of looks like crabgrass. And then you've got the topsoil, that light brown on the top. And then right where it turns a different color, that's the subsoil. And usually you can tell the subsoil from the topsoil because it's lighter in color, and that's the case here. I don't see a distinctive E horizon or leach layer in this profile. This is a soil that's actually pretty common around the Santa Barbara area and South Coast. I've seen this up in Gaviota and even in um, Mission Canyon area where you have very little topsoil. It's a little brown layer right under the O horizon and you hit the subsoil, which is this very dark, almost black clay layer. It's great for using in natural building and adobe and things, not good for planting in. Another soil profile showing you in contrast to this, um, the one previously, you're seeing a very dark, rich topsoil layer, a leach layer that looks kind of grayish color, and then you've got that subsoil, a very light material. This is a soil profile of a desert area, and you're seeing a little teeny um, o horizon, the desert crust that's just on the very top has a little bit of organic matter. And then you have um, some, what could be called a topsoil, that um, brownish area between zero and 20 centimeters down. And then it hits this layer that kind of bulges out called the caliche layer, a hard pan um, 
almost like fired clay layer and nothing can get underneath that. These are common in the desert southwest under um, just below a very thin alluvial layer. You often see this caliche layer, that's a hard pan layer. Back to soil texture in a little more detail. Um, texture is the proportion of sand, silt, and clay. Those are different particle size categories. Sands are the largest. They're 2 to 0 0.05 millimeters in size. Silt is 0.05 to 0 0.02 millimeters in size in diameter. And clay is less than 0 0.0002 millimeters, so much smaller. Most sand and clay, uh, excuse me, most sand and silt particles come from broken down rocks and minerals. The clay um, comes from chemical processes that transform other elements into clay. It's not directly from broken down sand or silt. You can do a soil texture test using a jar to shake up the soil with water and to look at those actually three layers of the percent sand, silt, and clay and use this textured triangle on the left to determine the type of soil it is. Is it a clay loam, a loam? Is it a clay? Is it silt? Is it sandy clay loam? Um, a, a quick test that takes about an hour can give you th those results. And most plants do best in what's called loam or something on this texture triangle that has the word loam in it is definitely preferable than the three vertices like silt, sand, and clay alone. Those soils are just gonna be um, too extreme for most plants. You can also test the texture of a soil by feel by taking a handful of soil in your, in your hand and adding some water, enough just to moisten the whole, um, the whole handful and kind of rubbing it until it kind of becomes a little mud patty. And then following this schematic chart, you try to rub a ribbon of it out between your forefinger and your thumb. And depending on if a ribbon can form or not, it can tell you how clayey it is. The touch of it is if it's gritty, it's more sandy, slippery, it's gonna be more clayey. Um, so there's, you can follow this to determine what type of soil too. And that, those soil types with those names are categories, but they help you decide if that's going to be supportive of your plants. Soil structure is the way the, the minerals and soil particles, those sand, silt, and clay, et cetera, are aggregating together into different types of forms. Good soil structure will have a lot of open spaces or pores in it for water to infiltrate and for roots also to grow down into. pH is important, as mentioned earlier. Um, most plants will do really well right, right around the 5.5 to 6.5 or 7 pH, which is basically neutral soil pH. And there are some plants that like acid, like blueberries, love a more acidic soil. There's plants that like more alkaline soils, um, some of the cabbage family plants, olives, etc. Most like that neutral zone. And this is giving you um, some idea of what these pH levels um, are like in reference to more common um, food items and other things like um, bleach is very alkaline, um, vinegar is very acidic, etc. The amount of organic matter in a soil is really important too. Um, most agricultural soils have about 3 to 6% soil organic matter. For every 1% increase in soil organic matter, we see a, an increase in soil water holding capacity by about 25,000 gallons. So organic matter, really important to be part of the soil. It can hold the water and thus support the plants even better. Here's a diagram of very simple soil food web. Organisms that are underground and what eats what in that food web, um, just showing you bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, arthropods, birds, and other animals. So, and they're all ultimately feasting on organic matter that comes from plants, biomass, roots, and leaves, and other things. But this is the food web underground, so the soil food web. And we've all been exposed to the above ground food web since we were children, but this is how this works underground. As rich and complex as anything above ground, one of the secondary consumers in the soil food web is a nematode. That's that dark um, roundworm that you're seeing. And this is a, um, 
a fungal hypha, so part of fungus that is actually trapping um, that nematode to eat it. So some fungi can actually help um, destroy those nematodes that can damage roots of the plants that you're trying to grow. This and the next three slides are describing the four major groups of microbes in the soil, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, and microarthropods, and the, the functions and um, interactions they have with other organisms in the soil food web. I'll let you read through, read through this and the next three on your own. One really interesting interaction in the soil is the fine roots of many, many plants actually exude sugars. This one is showing you a root ex, uh, exuding sugars right here. It's um, leaking out exudates. So those are carbohydrates, they're nutritious, and they're attracting the bacteria in the, in the proximate area there near the root tip. And those bacteria will then proliferate right there and do more decomposition of organic matter that's right there which releases the nutrients to the plant. So it's, it's, um, it's a reciprocal relationship. We've got a mutualism going on here where the bacteria are getting sugars and the plant is getting nutrients and water. This slide is just showing you all the benefits of having a healthy soil food web. And the reason they even put a list here of all the great things that the soil organisms do for the soil and for plants and the animals that sur um, survive and live off of those plants is because for so long, the soil food web has been neglected. Soil has been treated as an inert substance that we need to add fertilizers to. And um, really we've only in the last maybe 10 to 15 years really got on board as agriculturalists, horticulturalists and scientists realizing this soil is alive and the life of that soil, the microbes, the health and vigor of the populations of microbes is key to the health of the ecosystem right above that. And the list continues of benefits of a healthy soil biology to the rest of the organisms on the planet. And if the last two slides weren't enough to make you appreciate microbes, um, the actual Human Genome Project found that 99.3% of our genetic code is identical to microbial code. So, and also uh, if you look at all the different microbes that live in our body, you know, we're, we're just kind of a walking um, shell of microbes and some other tissues, but they're extremely important to all living things, especially in the guts of all um, animals and mammals. So we need them. It's always good to talk a little bit about organic um, food. You know, it's the legal term. Is it or raised in, as an organic food or not? Can it be sold as organic? Um, are they good? Is it better to buy organic than inorganic? Sure, it's better. It's raised in a way um, that is healthier for the organism, so, you know, to some degree, and definitely better for the soil. Uh, you're not using as many herbicides and pesticides, um, anything that's unnatural. Whether it's healthier for you, um, there are, have been some studies showing that organically raised food has more nutritional value. There are some studies that say that that's not the case. Um, you can decide for yourself. But so what I want to say at this point in this soils talk is it's definitely better for the soil. Is it enough? You have to decide what's enough. It was, it's a great step towards um, treating our soils and our ecosystems and organisms more humanely and in a healthy manner. But organic uh, to be organic, it does allow some toxins and pesticides to be used. So it's, it's not necessarily good for the soil. These bunny love carrots, I've seen them growing out in the Cuyama Valley, which is kind of in the high desert north of Ojai. And they are drawing down the water table at a, an alarming rate. When I first started going out to Quail Springs Permaculture Farm in that area, bunny love carrots were um, growing on, you know, off of Highway 33. And um, about 20 years ago, they, the water table was about 50 feet down, and now it's about 300 feet down because they're just pumping water out from the groundwater there, spraying it onto the bunny love carrots, which are a very high water use plant crop, 
and um, it's a desert. It ev most of it evaporates, so that's not good for the soil or the groundwater. The soil itself isn't necessarily treated um, with compost and uh, methods that build the biology. It's still stripping the soil and degrading it over time rather quickly. So um, my personal opinion is organic definitely is not enough to get us to a place where we're um, growing our crops in a regenerative manner. It is less bad. It's not necessarily good, as far as good meaning building soil health, regenerating soil thickness and complexity in biology. Um, it's just hurting it less. But you might have a different opinion. I am open to other ideas and gaining more knowledge and facts that um, might change my mind. So composting and composting in the proper way can make great soil addition um, and improve your soil and regenerate it. It's using all the scraps and food scraps and manure and other things from a site done the right way. Here's one being built at Quail Springs Permaculture Farm in Cuyama. Um, and that's made up of the manure from the animals on site and the kitchen waste and lots of other organic matter. I've even seen them um, throw in, they had a, a couple of goats that died and they threw the whole goat into the compost pile. They made the compost pile big enough that over time it all broke down, all of it, even the bones. So if you do it right, it, uh, it can really decompose almost anything. So how do you do it right? Let's look at the next slide. Of course, a great way to build soil health is to make compost and add it to your soil regularly. This is showing you a graph of the temperature of a healthy compost pile. In the first week, it should go up above 131, usually to about 145 degrees Fahrenheit is really good to get it up there. And then it might go down a little bit and you um, could add a little more grain to get kick it back up to 141 for a few more days, if not week, about a week. And then slowly over time, it will um, get cooler as, uh, as other microbes take over. That, that first part, the hot part is where the thermophilic bacteria are really going to town and doing a lot of decomposition and creating heat, which encourages more bacteria to grow. Um, after a couple of weeks, it should start to cool down and that's when the bacteria, the bacterial population start to um, decrease and you get uh, fungi start to take over that slowly over the next few months will decompose the brown carbon material. A picture of a nice aged compost that's sitting there after the initial bacterial um, population has eaten up all the green stuff and you're seeing a white fungal um, hyphal net there underneath the surface. So that's good. That hyphae is going to be breaking down all the carbon dry brown material over time. The one thing about a compost pile is that once you make it, you can't add anything to it for a few months. So what do you do with all those that green waste and kitchen waste that you get in the meantime. Well, if you just want a smaller system that can take food scraps every single day, you want to do some worm composting or vermicomposting. And um, you can have a small box or a Rubbermaid tub. You can even have it underneath your sink or right outside the kitchen. So it's really easy to get rid of this kitchen waste and the worms will pretty much handle. You know, one typical Rubbermaid tub, it's like about two by three. Um, feet, a couple feet deep. Um, that can be your worm bin that can handle the kitchen waste for a family of four about. Here's an image of um, a couple working at a commercial worm farm where worm castings are produced for commercial sale. Of course, adding compost tea regularly to your soil will also enhance the soil biology and regenerate the soil richness it's a great thing to add along with these other ideas that I'm sharing. Compost tea is taking really good compost, putting it in a mesh bag, sub, um, submerging that in water that's highly aerated. And what you're doing is you're not uh, creating like nutrient fertilizer, you're, you're growing microbes. You, you add a few other things to it, sometimes molasses, kind of sugary stuff into the liquid. And the microbes, mostly the bacteria and the fungi that are in that compost in that bag come out into the water they find their food and you're growing soil bacteria and soil fungi to a high concentrated level. And then you're putting that tea out on the soil underneath your plants. So you're increasing the amount of 
decomposing organisms in the soil. You're not adding nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium. You're adding the organisms that can make those things available to the plant by breaking down the organic matter. Of course, humanure and uh, composting toilets can be used to um, compost the human waste in a anaerobic process first and then into an aerobic type of composting pile and that can be used um, on fruit trees. Not the best for vegetables just because people are still pretty gun shy having their waste around their food crops um, but it can be used in fruit trees or other types of perennials that are not near the veggies.